Awesome. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone, to the talk. Uh, so my name's Will. I'm with Element Finance. And uh, I'm going to tell a really cool story today and connect that to sort of how the market reacted to it and also how fixed rate primitives sort of are involved with that and part of that. So how fixed rate primitives work in a world of DGENs and rug pulls. I'm going to go into the story of 0x Sifu, um, what happened with Abracadabra, the entire scandal that, you know, went there with Wonderland. Sort of use that as a premise for this talk. Um, and then connect that to see, like, how did that affect the markets overall? Uh, so let's begin the story. So Quadriga CX was an exchange that was in Canada, had a lot of volume. It was one of the biggest exchanges that was operating over there. And the CEO at the time was a guy named Gerald Cotton. So Gerald Cotton was like this happy guy, smiling. People really liked him. He garnered a lot of trust from people. And he was sort of for a while like a poster boy in, in Canada, and people sort of looked up to him. And uh, it just so happened he went on a trip to Jaipur, India, um, and actually uh, died, according to the stories. And uh, this, this part of Jaipur, India, is actually been famous for, there's sort of like a cartel there that uh, gives death certificates to people for you know, a certain amount of money. And so a lot of basically theories and conspiracy theories and different things came together as a result of this. So Quadriga CX, right before he went over there, right before he died, um, they were actually using people's assets, funds in the market to long, short trade. Uh, they were buying up a bunch of different assets. They actually ended up getting a balance sheet to be less than the amount of assets that were put into Quadriga CX from the users. Um, so they were already close to insolvency and uh, could not pay back people's funds. So it was sort of this interesting you know, coincidence that as he went out there, um, he, you know, died and he was the only one with the access to the keys and therefore they weren't able to give people's funds back. So there's currently a mini year investigation that's going on regarding this. So uh, before I, you know, go deeper into this talk and talk about everything, I want to give a disclaimer. Um, so I'm covering theories that people had, the concerns, uh, what, you know, a lot of people sort of speculated on. This may not be what actually happened. Um, this isn't necessarily my opinion. I just want to share what people sort of, you know, took through this and how they reacted to it. So Michael Patreon was also co-founder of Quadriga CX, close to Gerald Cotton, um, one of the founders, very, very involved in that um, as well. So Michael Patreon, we all know, um, as 0x Sifu. So 0x Sifu, and I'll go into this, was sort of, you know, in, involved with Wonderland, which was basically a part of an ecosystem of a bunch of DeFi projects. Um, there's three in particular that I'll talk about um, in specific. So when 0x Sifu was doxxed, um, this is sort of one of the threads that went into this, as that co-founder of Quadriga CX, it ended up basically creating this cascading effect, because he was involved in Wonderland. He was on a multi-sig for Wonderland and the treasure there. Uh, Treasury there had basically access to the funds there. People really, really started to be nervous and worried. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, Daniel uh, basically was, you know, co-founder of these ecosystem projects. So there were three ecosystem projects that sort of made up this entire system. Uh, Popsicle Finance, uh, Abracadabra, MIM, Spell, as you guys are all very familiar with, and then the decentralized wonderland, which is sort of where this entire, you know, scandal, controversy, everything began. So uh, I'll kind of go into what each of these were real quick, and then we'll dive in a bit deeper. So Abracadabra um, basically allows you to mint MIM, which is a stable coin pegged to the dollar, um, using interest-bearing assets. So there are urine assets that you could use and some others, particularly one that comes from... Um, that specifically came from Wonderland, so get into that here. Uh, then Wonderland was essentially a fork of Olympus, some adjustments, some different changes that was operating on Avalanche. And uh, within uh, the Wonderland ecosystem, there was an asset called Wrapped Memo. And Wrapped Memo was an interest-bearing asset that was taken as collateral on Ab Abracadabra. So you could take the Wrapped Memo that you got through the Wonderland ecosystem um, on Avalanche, you could take that, you could collateralize it on Abracadabra, and you can mim, mim from it. Um, and again, 
you know, Xerix Sifu, who is sort of involved with Wonderland, a very active contributor. He was docked, doxxed as Michael Patreon, the co-founder of Quadriga CX. And thus, there was a large reaction and um, a lot of people started panicking. So everyone started freaking out. They began worrying. And then a lot of theories began coming to fruition. Uh, so one, one of the hugest criticisms in how, you know, Daniel and these other people responded to this is when this came out, uh, it was clear that Daniel, you know, at the time knew who Xerox Sifu was, um, and the project wasn't super responsive. They were quiet um, on the Discord when people were asking them, and this put a lot of uncertainty into this ecosystem. And this sort of cascaded the lack of trust and the lack of, you know, uh, confidence in these systems as a whole. So people started freaking out more and more. This is sort of in contrast to wormhole finance. Uh, they had a $220 million hack, but they responded immediately. Uh, they were on, on top of everything, and they actually used it as an opportunity to gain trust from the community, and they actually built a lot of goodwill. So in contrast with that, uh, you know, essentially, they were not responsive. People started freaking out. And so I'm sure you all saw the Twitter drama, all the threads, everything that happened that was involved in that. So the theories begin. So Xerox Sifu, um, co-founder of Quadriga CX, he had multi-sig multi access um, to 400, over $400 million in treasury um, for Wonderland. Um, a number of transactions they had seen, Xerox Sifu was sending through Tornado Cash, um, which again started creating a little bit more worry and a little bit more concern through the whole situation. Um, so, what were people thinking was happening? Why did the market start freaking out? So, uh, Daniel and also Xerox Sifu um, had, you know, a connection, or the theory is they had a connection to Bitfinex, um, where funds were being cashed out. And so, people began believing that actually Abracadabra, this entire ecosystem, was actually created as an exit strategy uh, for Xerox Sifu and a number of other characters. So. What they saw was Xerox Sifu was able to take this wrapped memo uh, that he had from you know, Wonderland. He was able to mint MIM from it. And then basically through MIM on Curve, there's a uh, MIM pool, which is uh, balanced with 3Pool, which is a mix of DAI, USDC, and USDT. And so the theory is they were using the Abracadabra ecosystem to mint that MIM, convert it to DAI, USDC, USDT, cash it out on Bitfinex, and then exit and have funds in their bank account. And so, again, this was this is what people were worrying about. People started freaking out. They lost confidence in the ecosystem of all these projects. They lost confidence in Daniel at the time, um, and they were extremely worried. And so the, the market started speculating that MIM was going to break PEG. So uh, essentially breaking PEG is MIM supposed to be uh, e equivalent to a dollar, uh, they were expecting through all of this, the sell-offs, the scandals, how legit were these ecosystems that it might drop down to 80 cents, 75 cents, go down significantly, and people would freak out, there'd be massive sell-offs, and the whole ecosystem would crash. And so this created some very interesting results. So some of the degening began. So uh, there's a concept called folded borrowing. So folded borrowing is essentially and I'll use it, you know, in this example. Essentially, you take, let's say, you know, you're in USDC position, you collateralize it, you mint a bunch of MIM, um, and it's at the dollar peg in this moment. Um, then you go, you sell it for three pool, USDC, DAI, USDT. You go back into that interest-bearing asset, you collateralize again, you mint MIM, you do this recursively a number of times, a bunch of times. And so essentially what you end up getting um, and the speculation is that if you do this over and over and over again, um, let's say you accumulate $1 million in collateral, the peg breaks, it goes to 80 cents, you basically make $200,000 profit instantly, like super simple. And so people were betting it was gonna go down, they were doing this folded borrowing, even more MIM was being sold on Curve, at this point, and uh, it ended up causing this massive imbalance in the curve pool. So uh, the currency reserves at the time uh, ended up getting to an extreme level. So uh, the pool in, uh, in curve at one point was at 95% MIM and only 5% three pool. So as this started happening, people sort of took two sides, right? 
people freaking out that it's going to break peg, held a bunch of MIM. They started panic selling their MIM. Um, and then you also had the other people who were speculating that it was going to you know, go to that 80 cents because people were panic selling. They were going to make a ton of money on this. And so they ended up you know, doing this folded borrowing, which ended up making it so everyone's selling MIM. You know, the balance in the curve pool ends up being you know, 95 to 5. It's crazy. Um, and this is what ended up happening. This is what was going on. So it turns out, you know, Curve's stable swap algorithm is actually pretty strong, even at like a pretty high imbalance. Um, and so some people sort of saw it and they were like, okay, uh, the Curve stable swap algorithm is going to be pretty like solid here, even at this like, you know, this pretty big split. Um, it's probably going to like still keep peg. Um, also, MIM was highly collateralized by a bunch of interest-bearing assets, not just, uh, ju not just RAP memo. So a lot of people were like, okay, so even if we have these issues with RAP memo, MIM has amazing collateral, probably going to be okay. It probably won't break pegs. This is sort of the other side that people saw. So again, I want to give a disclaimer. Um, covering theories, uh, concerns people had, the going ideas that were on Twitter, the going theories, these don't actually represent what I believe necessarily because I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So just want to give this you know, clear disclaimer. Um, so let's connect this to fixed rate primitives and how it created this really cool effect in those markets. And uh, I want to show you guys like how fixed rate primitives are actually a lot more interesting and they can work. Um, you know, they're not just simple fixed rate uh, tools. So let me dive into that. So first I want to talk about what you know, Element does to sort of explain how fixed rate primitives work. Um, so in Element, we have you know, this idea, um, if you have 100 ETH and let's say you know, there's a yield position, let's say you're in ETH, I'm using numbers here that make it easy, um, and there's 20% 20, 20 APY, what you can do with Element, you pick a three month time frame or a six month time frame, you deposit into that yield position, so you're still getting the interest, everything else, and you get two new tokens out of it. So one represents the principal. So you put 100 ETH in, your principal will always be 100 ETH, you get 100 ETH back, right? Um, the other one is the yield. So you get 100 yield tokens, and that's the interest that you gain over this time period. So essentially, over three months, you put 100 ETH down, 20% APY, in that three months, you get 100 ETH at the end for your principal that you can redeem. Um, and then on your interest, a separate representative of the interest that you have in the three months, at a 20% average, you can redeem that for 5% APY. Um, so what we you know, have done and what, what you can do, which is really cool, is we have basically a constant power sum invariant. Uh, we you know, built this into Balancer but essentially allows a market for people to take the principle that they're doing um, and create a market out of it where people can sell, buy the principle, and it sort of as a side effect creates these fixed rate primitives. And I'll talk about that in a second. And this, this specific invariant is optimized for fixed rates, um, which assume that over time, that 100 ETH will be uh, completely exchangeable for 100 ETH. So it essentially works as a stable swap at the end. And in the beginning, it allows for a variant in, in the price and the rates that you see. So uh, the best way I can describe this is, uh, you know, if I have a dollar and I say, hey, you can't use this dollar for three months, um, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, well, you lose, like, an opportunity because you can't use that dollar. You can't put it on a yield position. Um, so, you, you know, what is it worth you, for you to take that dollar? So... It's like saying, I'm going to give you 90 cents for this dollar, right? So I'm going to buy a dollar for cheaper, but it's, it's locked up. And at the end of the three months, I can use it. So we saw this really cool thing in our platform when we first launched. We were in a market lull. Um, the market was sort of, you know, yield rates had gone down significantly at the time. And we saw something interesting through the markets where our fixed rates were actually higher than the variable rates on pretty much all our positions. And the reason why this was is people were speculating that the variable rates were going to go up. This is a temporary market lull. Um, and it was pretty cool. They actually made a lot of returns by doing this speculation because they were right. The rates went up pretty quickly. 
And uh, so what people do, we call the seal token compounding. It's this like recursive game that you can do through the fixed rate marketplaces we have where you can like six, 10, 20 X leverage into variable interest. Um, won't go into too much depth here, but the idea is you start off with 10 ETH, variable rates 20, you speculate, the current fixed rate's 10, you take 10 ETH, you mint the principal and the yield tokens, you sell your 10, your 10 principal tokens at the discount, now you have 9 ETH in liquidity, you remint, now you have 19 ETH exposure to the variable interest, you sell your principal again at the 20% discount, you have 8.1 ETH, 27.1 in exposure to the variable interest, repeat, rinse recursively, I can end up at the end, nine cycles, I have four ETH in liquidity, and I have 65 ETH uh, exposure to variable interest, basically giving me a 6.5X leverage into the variable side. And so like, if you follow these rates and what's going on, essentially at the end of that time, my final redeemable balance would be 16.9 ETH. That's a 4.9 ETH gain. I got 69% APY on a position that was going for 20%. So this is, this is like mind blowing, it's cool. This is some of the things people do with our platform. Tons of other things they do, but. Um, so let's connect this. Um, the MIM scandal and everything that happened. So people started believing that the, uh, essentially MIM was gonna break peg, that, that way the variable interest they were gonna get was gonna go way down people started basically taking the market where the fixed rate ended up shooting up to 130% uh, because they were panic selling a bunch of the, um, a bunch of the uh, fixed rate MIM, the principal tokens. We ended up having 130% APY on MIM on our platform at this time. It was crazy. Uh, and a bunch of people uh, got a lot of returns through playing with this market. So, First, it went up to 130%. Bunch of people bought it up, brought it down to 50%, went back up to 90%. Bunch of people bought, bought it up and normalized back to normal value. So basically one of the things that I'm sort of, you know, getting to and what the, these markets and fixed rate markets work as is there's sort of this highly liquid arbitrage market that actually lets you look at where variable rates are gonna go. Are they gonna go up? Are they gonna go down? You can play with these. There's a ton of opportunity and it's so liquid because if you think about it, the principal, if I put a million dollars in principal down and there's 10% APY, interest is only 100K, but my principal is a million. So I have 10X the liquidity on the principal that is still following the variable interest. This is like a cool, cool secret, cool trick. Um, and uh, you don't even need to play on the specific variable side because they sort of converge to the same thing. And so it acted as this arbitrage, this sentiment market. People got this opportunity um, and it was really, really cool. So one of the things sort of what I you know, wanna draw from this talk is that fixed rates, these markets, they're way bigger. They trickle into so much more they let people actually see and play with variable rates at like a much higher liquidity, a much higher degree, leveraging into this. And uh, fixed rates aren't just, just this boring, simple concept. It's actually a wide market. There's tons of use cases. And these use cases like increase even more and more um, as these fixed rate primitives become collateral on different markets. And you can sort of supercharge these opportunities even more. So uh, Element Finance, we have a ton of really cool things in the work. We're doing a bunch of awesome things. Um, perpetual exposures to uh, fixed rates, some really cool AMM designs. We're launching a new governance uh, primitive. It's a protocol called the, um, it's the Council Protocol, uh, which we're doing a bunch of innovation on. Um, there's some other cool things that we're bringing to the market you guys are gonna see. We have an amazing team innovating at like a really, really high level and it's really, really exciting. Um, and that's how I wanna essentially conclude the talk. There's a lot that you can get in the fixed rate market. So um, thank you, uh, Will Villanueva, uh, Element Finance. If you guys have any questions, just come ask me and most of my team is here. We're all here at uh, ETH Denver and we're gonna be here for the next few days, so thank you. Thank you.